This is Journal Club, the AMI. And it's getting to be summertime, so these things get a little more, a little briefer. But Anjali Asatimbe is going to be presenting on defective apoptotic cell contractility. Ooh, I got it this time. Provokes sterile inflammation leading to liver damage and tumor suppression. And why Anjali decided to show, choose liver damage as her subject is a question I've had all week. Uh, Angela, are you there? Yeah. Wh why did you choose this paper? Um, I don't know. I thought it was interesting. Okay. Um, but not having to do with the the liver damage that Samita caused in my, my body, right? Why don't you give me COVID? No. Okay. Um, so uh, do you want to try sharing your screen? Yeah. Did it work? It's starting to, yes. Uh, and once you start your present, uh, it, once you start presenting it, so I think you still need to go into present mode on the slides. Yeah. Okay. And just remember that they, uh, for some reason, there's that bug. So you might have to go forward. Why don't you do that now? Go forward a couple slides and then go back to the beginning just to get it. Yeah. Okay. Now go back to the first one. Hopefully that'll do it. Okay, so defective apoptotic cell contractility provokes sterile inflammation, leading to liver damage and tumor suppression. So apoptosis is a form of programmed cell death, and it results from proteases or caspases that cleave target proteins at specific sequences. And you can see on the picture on the right, you can see the engineered caspase activation. And the physiological purpose of the apoptotic morpho morphological events is still unknown. You mind if I jump in every once in a while? No, I just fine. wanted yeah, I just wanted to point out caspase is one the enzyme uh, that what's widely used in molecular biology to cleave things. But what might ring a bell with some of you guys is that CRISPR actually uses a caspase. It's actually called the technically the CRISPR Cas system, and the Cas refers to the caspase. So it's a it does cleavage of nucleic acids and proteins and stuff like that. Okay. So pharmacological inhibition revealed that rock contributed to MLC phosphorylation, cell contraction, membrane blebbing, and nuclear fragmentation in ap apoptotic cells. So figure one. One more thing. Um, if you can go back to that slide, which is a good thing anyway, because it's not... No, it's not showing up for me. Is it showing up for you guys? Correctly? Yes. Yeah. One corner's messed up for me. Yeah, one corner's messed up for me too. Um, go forward and then back again. There we go. Okay. So apoptosis, let's let's draw the distinction here. Apoptosis is good cell death. And it's really like seppuku. They these cells are told, hey, you need to uh, we don't need you anymore. Like when you're an embryo and you're growing a tail, right? All of us had a tail. Some of us still do. I have a friend who has a tail. Um, and and I think he had surgery to remove it. I think I told somebody that. Uh, and uh, what about 
you know, teeth in a beak, the beak of a bird, right? Teeth aren't very useful. A lot of these vestigial structures, they need to be, they need to go away. How they go away is cells need to die. But this is very, very different from necrosis, which is the other type of cell death. Necrosis means things are exploding in an uncontrolled way. But can, actually, can you, uh, Angela, can you go back? Uh, not, don't move the slide. This is the slide I want you on. But, but just explain a little bit about how apoptosis occurs based um, on this figure. So it's basically a, a like a cast base cleaves to a protein at a specific point. Mm -hmm. What about on the left, though? Like, what's, what does it actually look like is kind of the interesting thing to, well, to, to young people. Because, you know, if I, if I told you death was good, you'd probably be like, well, you guys would probably be like, why would you say, why would you say something like that? But cell program cell death, apoptosis, is good. It's supposed to happen. It's part of the programming. But it doesn't look like a stroke or some other major necrosis. So do you, can you explain the left figure? Um, I'm not sure, because I was mostly focusing on... Oh, okay. Okay. Right. Well, then I'll do it, because... Uh, let's say you have a stroke, right? You have, a, you have some sort of embolism that goes and blocks blood flow to your brain. The cells that require oxygen aren't getting it because there's no blood flowing there anymore. So they start doing glycolysis uh, without oxygen. So it's not the regular cell respiration. They have to do lots and lots and lots of it, except as they do that, they're building up more and more lactic acid, which then eventually causes them to starve enough that they, that they can't control their processes at all. And they explode. And when they explode, which is cell lysis, they, they, it's not a pretty thing. They do not compartmentalize all of their, all the parts that are in the cell. Instead, all of those innards go everywhere. And, and if you're in the brain, neurons going boom means that glutamate, the excitatory neurotransmitter, gets spilled all, all over everything. So uh, that's what necrosis looks like in the brain. Okay, that's not apoptosis. Another another version, if you've ever heard of gangrene, so if a, a limb gets infected and becomes gangrenous, gangrene is really tissue death and infection. So you you get you, you're like things things will turn black because it's dead. You're, it's connected to you and it's dead and it's beginning to decompose. Um, so those are those are uncontrolled cell death, bad. Apoptosis is a little different. Apoptosis is super important, of course, and it also is extremely well controlled. It receives the signal that, she, that Angela just said, and then it goes, okay, it's time to die. It takes out its little sword and, you know, but instead of just like spilling its guts all over the place, it actually goes, okay, I'm going to package this stuff and bleb it off. I'm going to package this stuff and I'm going to bleb it off. And, and so eventually you have all of these little packages of former cell. It's as if it's like the equivalent of I'm going to cut off my foot and put it in a little box. I don't want to make a mess. Then I'm going to cut off the rest of my leg and I'll put that in another little box. I don't want anyone to have to make a mess, right? It's kind of seems silly, but that's what the cell's doing. And by doing it in a controlled fashion, you don't get any of the bad side effects. You don't cause other cells to necessarily die. Uh, and then, and then it, right at the bottom, it says, notice it says no inflammation. That's a, that's a key. Uh, you have these, these macrophages that come in and they eat the little pieces of cell. Whereas if a cell exploded, it causes immediate inflammatory signaling. Uh, and that's bad. And inflammation means you're going to get scar tissue and all that other stuff. Okay. Sorry, that was a long-winded explanation, but apoptosis is one of the most important processes in biology. I don't know if Ms. Hughes would agree with that. Ms. Hughes? Just a that? side question. Just yes. A side question. 
Is um, webbing something off? Is that a scientific term? Actually, yeah. It is actually called, and it, uh, it's actually, it actually says that in the one, two, three, the third cell looking thing on the left in her, in the slide she's showing. We actually technically call it blebbing. Yeah. Why does it have a meaning somewhere else? I've never, I don't think I've ever used it for any other, any other, in any other context. No, I just assumed you made it up. That's all. No, no, it's, yeah, it's literally called blebbing. Yeah. Um, okay, Angela, you can continue. Thanks. Okay, so in the paper to show the importance of apoptotic ROC1 activation, a mouse was mutated in the ROC1 caspase cleavage site to render the protein caspase resistant. So in figure 1a, it's showing that McTagged ROC1 immunoparticipated from HEK 293T cells and Immunoprecipitated, it's basically when you pre precipitate protein, a protein antigen out of a solution with, anti with an antibody binding to the protein. And this was examined for MLC phosphorylation. And then in 1B, there's homozygous mouse embryo fibroblasts for ROC1 wild type, which is in green, and ROC1 non-cleavable, which is shown in red. And you can see that it's stained with DRAC5. In 1C, there's ROC1 wild type and ROC1 non-cleavable, which were either left untreated or treated with TNFA, which is tumor necrosis factor A. Then in the in images D, E, and F, there's homozygous wild type and non-cleavable MEFs untreated or treated with TNFA plus CHX or anti CD95 antibody to induce apoptosis. And then in 1G, it shows the left panel shows a cleared PARP1 and A tubulin four hours after the TNFA plus CHX. And then the right panel, it shows recombinant. GST PA, PAK2 as a control for the efficiency of protein recovery. Okay. Um, so in cool yeah. narcissistic aside, um, since since you are talking about my disease, uh, the the drug I'm on is cocaine. No, the drug I'm on is is something called uh, Humira, and that's actually something that interferes with TNF alpha, which is what Angeli just mentioned, uh, tumor necrosis factor, which means I guess I'm more likely to get cancer. Oh well. Okay, uh, go, Angeli, go forward one and back and back again because it's not showing up right. There you go. Okay. So in Figure Two. You can see in the first line, it's you can see the fibroblasts for ROC1 wild type, and you can see how they forcibly contracted. And then in the second line, you can see the fibroblasts for ROC1 non cleavable, and you can see that they didn't really forcibly contract the way the other ones did. So. And then figure three. So what, what is your interpretation or their interpretation of that? Um, it's, I don't know. Well, let's, let's ask other people. Anybody else get an idea what that meant?
I'll be honest, the non-versed eye, those images all look the same. <laughs> uh, right. Especially that, what, part of B? All of those. Yeah, I think, Angela, you were, you were focusing, though, on A, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, and, and A is a remarkable. So fibroblasts are skin cells. Um, I think this is a mouse, though. This is mouse, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we get skin cells from mice by either doing a cheek swab, which is, Miss Hughes, did you ever have to do a mouse cheek swab? Because that's pretty technically hysterical. And then, I don't know if she's here. Uh, and then, uh, or the more common type is that the uh, you you would actually cut a piece of their tail off. So you dip it in some some cold ethanol until it's numb, and then cut a little tiny piece off. Uh, and and you would you'd take those cells and spread them out on a plate, and they and they they'll stick to it. Uh, and so they look like the top image on the right. Now, this particular experiment they exposed these things to they expose it to tumor necrosis factor alpha and cyclohexamide if you put cy cyclohexamide on cells they tend to kill themselves um but with the mutation the nc type i'm sorry got that backwards with the nc type that's when they're contracting Whereas the the other ones are not, is that right? Did I did I get that right? Because I'm still, yeah, right, yeah. Wait, no, what? Do not undergo full contraction. Oh no, no, yes, yeah. So so if, so, don't look at the the top pictures. Look at the no. How do I explain this? If you look at the top right photo, that is not a healthy cell. That is a cell that's blebbing. You can see all the little blebs all over it, okay? So it had undergone a forceful contraction because it received a signal, the signals I just said, cyclohexamide and, and tumor necrosis factor, but the other one did not. The one underneath, and you can see that the bottom row of A, those fibroblasts look healthy the, pretty much the whole time. And the one on the... The second one down on the far right with the scanning electron micrograph, that may look like a mess, but that's actually kind of what fibroblasts look like. They're super sticky. Skin cells have to be sticky so that they stick to each other and hold you together like you're supposed like, you know, instead of just falling into a puddle. So, so this is claiming then that these, this particular mutation does not allow them to apoptose correctly and apoptose is a word that's a that's the verb fair all right go ahead angela i'm sorry to interrupt so many times okay so oh, go, go forward and back again it's doing it again there, there you go okay yeah yeah um so figure 3a it's the tunnel staining of apoptotic cells in representative liver sections. And then 3B shows the H and E staining of representative liver sections. And this is just to show the chemically induced liver damage in ROC1 non cleavable mice. Right. So Again, thinking about the, the implications of this, apoptosis is controlled cell death. It's supposed to happen. If you have cells that don't respond when they're supposed to, then, then that means they are not supposed to be there. Those are cells that are still alive and, and they're not dying when they're supposed to, which then causes further complications down the road. That makes sense. Now, here's a question for all of you. First of all, I'd like you all on your, uh, I'd like you all to have your cameras on. 
This is an important question. Uh, I have said before that the way I envision this program, once you're in the program and you graduate from the program, you're always in the program. You're welcome to come back for the summer stuff, right? So this summer we're learning about um, we're learning about PCR, this polymerase chain reaction, and we're working. Uh, we're going to be learning about 3D anim, three not animation, 3D model construction with the assignment I'm giving you having nothing to do with science, but should be something fun and, and personally interesting to you. And I believe I may have gotten an interior designer from New York City to teach it. She volunteered. So, and that's kind of a big deal. She does, she does a lot of business in New York City and, and knows how to use that. But next year, I think I was thinking that what I'd like you guys to learn is, is this. The figure you're looking at is a type of stain. So there are, a bu actually, so Miss Hughes, I mean, Miss Liff also, if you've ever done this, but Miss Hughes, I know you probably have. What type of staining or immunohistochemistry have you done? I, I see you, I see you, I, I'll, I could, I could. Uh, I had my mic muted on my computer and I was yeah. trying to. Anyways, um, mostly Western blot. That's what I've done. Oh, so not not so much actually in situ stuff. Not too much, no. Okay, because and and Miss Liff, have you ever done any of? No, because you know one of these years, I do want I do want to do a marine or you know some other biology that's not necessarily molecular, you know. But I'm I'm starting with go with what you know, you know, and so. Uh, immunohistochemistry, like every molecular biologist should know how to do PCR. Every molecular biology, yeah, every molecular biologist or early neuroscientist should know how to do this, should know how to do immunohistochemistry and staining of slices, which means, and maybe this will make it interesting for you, which means we would need animals to stain. I don't know if you're opposed to that or even if I'd be allowed to do it. I would try to do it the right way. I would get permission from the community and from the school to ethically sacrifice animals so that we could learn these processes. You think that's something that would fly here? Yes. <laughs> Marco does. But adults... Dr. Kerr, do you think that would fly here? Would you be willing to do that? As long as it's not a cat. Oh, I was just, that's what, you took it out of my face. I was just about to say we're going to do cats. I hate cats. Um, well, yeah, so I, so I was thinking we, that I would invest in, so next year's investment would be in a, something called a cryostat, a machine that is at freezing temperatures that you slice really super thin slices of tissue and then you put them on slides and you go through the process of staining them and then you take you do imaging uh with a microscope and that would be the other expensive thing i need to i need to get i mean eventually and then maybe the next year we do um whatever marine people do i don't know anything about that we, I mean, we marine Marina. I'm just thinking the response is going to be similar to one that I got this year with its eyes were staring at me in my dreams. So, <laughs> no, no, no. I, well, I, the methodologies don't have to involve death. I mean, PCR is we're using our own cheek cells. I mean, if Samita has anything to do with it, it should probably go and infect other people. But it's, I, otherwise, it's that's a non harmful thing. Um, She's going to be swabbing her cheek and then like sticking it on other people. Here, have some COVID. Uh, but I, I, you know, animals I think would really work for this thing. Or we could even use uh, frogs. I mean, frogs are easy. Uh, I could grow a bunch of tadpoles in a bucket in a fridge. There's so many different things we could do. What we need to do, people, though is if the chapel's moving, we need to annex it, like plant a flag in the current chapel and be like, oh, science, science department AMI claims this. Boom. Thoughts? Anybody willing to do that and get, I mean, sometimes when you're protesting, you get arrested. It's, it's just a risk you take. 
You might get thrown out of school, but you will have sacrificed on behalf of us. All right. Well, I think I've digressed enough. Sorry, Angelian, you were not expecting me to go off on tangents like that, but I thought it was a good time to bring that up, you, that you guys should be thinking about methods you might want to learn. And we don't just have to conserve it or reserve it for the summer. If there's a method that I could teach you now that I have the resources to do it, I'm willing to do that. You know, you want to learn how to run gels. You want to learn, uh, just let me know. You want to, uh, basic stuff, like how to, how to make a solution. That seems like it should be easy, but I heard how your AP lab went last week with all the broken glass. Um, who was that? Was that Sarah McTie? Who's not here to defend herself? Or was that Kirsten? Kirsten, was that you? Yeah. Oh, it was you personally? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was an expensive nickel. Uh, it cost about five cents, that t test tube you broke. So I expect you to pay by check, payable to me. Um, broken glass happens. But it, I think a, a good skill to have is that you need, you know, to be able to, to do molarity and, and make solutions and make them sterile. Uh, we haven't done, we've done pseudo sterile and Johan's constantly joking about pseudo. Is he in here? I don't see him. Johan? No? All right. I digress enough. Go ahead, Angeli. Okay. So in figure four, you can see the higher neutrophil infiltration in chemically damaged rock one non cleavable livers. And if you look at the graph for 4B, you can see on the y-axis there's the neutrophils and the x-axis has the time. And there's there's a red line that stands that's for the non-cleavable and you can see that its peak is higher than that of the, the green line for wild type. So figure five. You know what's kind of interesting about that? Go back. Did you see they put the p-value on the graph? I'm starting to think that e-life has gone downhill. That's a weird thing to do. On B. Okay. I'm going to ask a question of the group, of the peanut gallery, which is a question that Miss Liff will get immediately because I've asked this question like 10 times. It's always been the same answer. What's wrong with that graph? And not really the graph, but the statistics that they ran. Wouldn't the p-value not have to be there? Like That's just wrong. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's that's a little tacky. I'd say that's kind of tacky. Uh, I bet you that's there because because a reviewer said. I bet they said the p value was slightly or was slightly over 0.05 or something like that, or and so they had to repeat the experiment, and then they put it there as a to stick it to them. That happens. People people do that stuff. There's a different problem. Statistically. What type of test did they run? You guys figure it out for a moment. Is it Chris Wallace? Dr. Char. Uh, that was uh, Miss Bauer, ladies and gentlemen. She's back. Uh, uh, yeah. What'd they run? Chris Wallace. What? No, they didn't. They should have run a Crucible Wallace. They did not. What they run? 
Actually, they shouldn't have run the Crucible Wallace either. It's the same thing. Every time I ask you about stats, it ends up being the same problem. And over. Oh, wait a minute. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Crucible Wallace is the correct answer. Yes, that's what they should have run because it's non-parametric. You're right. I'm wrong. You're right. But what did they actually run? They, you would think, oh, well, the mistake is they ran an ANOVA because they thought it was parametric. They didn't. Did you see it, Miss Liv? No, I'm having a hard time making up the graphs. If you look at the figure legend... Oh, wait a minute. Are you guys only looking at... Uh, you're only looking at what Angeli put up. Here, I'll, I'll just read it to you. Um, for B... Immunohistochemistry staining with anti uh, S100 alpha 9 antibody for FFPE liver sections from ROC1 wild type and ROC1 NC mice 72 hour, hours after den injection. Then it tells you what the scale bar is. It tells you that how the neutrophils were scored in five random fields per section per mouse and that a pairwise student's t-test was run each time. What do you think? Is a t-test appropriate for that particular statistical analysis? No. Why? Because it is non-parametric. That's tr what's the evidence of that first of all. So everybody is with you on that one. You're you're right, but what's the evidence? How would you know it's non-parametric? The p-value. No. Like there's, like the like the amount of possibilities for the data to be. I'm not wording that correctly, but what are the two rules for a parametric test? You need you need to pass two assumptions. What are they? The data must be. normal okay we don't know about normality in this particular graph and the variances cannot be significantly different look at the very how how much variation there is in the in the pink dots over 72 hours versus the green ones the green ones are all pretty tightly packed and the red ones are all spread out you cannot compare them their variability their variance is is too great that's actual variance, not variability. Okay. And so it's non-parametric. But furthermore, you can't compare things. I can't. It's another one of those examples where it's like, this is that's an inappropriate statistical test. You cannot compare the wild type versus, versus the NC as if the rest of the experiment didn't happen. You can't do that. You have to actually say, I know it was over time. And so I'm using all of those data points and you would run a Crucible Wallace the way Marco said. Should be a Crucible Wallace, right? You'd still get the, I mean, obviously, even to your eye, there is a significant difference here, right? So you would get it if you ran it right, but you, but that's not, you don't do it with a t-test. A t-test is a pairwise comparison when you actually have two, four, six, eight, 10 different possibilities, right? You have the wild type at zero and the NC at zero. Then you have the wild type at 24 and then the NC at 24. And then you have the wild type at 48. And then you have the, the NC at 48. Do you see how each one's different, a different measurement? You're supposed to indicate that you, that you looked at all of them. And I'm fairly confident because, because they're looking over a circadian time scale. So, meh. Good call, Marco. All right. Uh, go ahead, Angela. I'm sorry. Okay. So, figure five shows how the inhibition of high mobility group B1 signaling reduces den induced liver damage.
And then figure six, six A, it shows the timeline of den induced HCC protocol. And six B shows the representative livers for ROC1 wild type and ROC1 non cleavable. And, and, so, and so, what, what, remember we, when we went over this, like, what is it that I'm looking at? This is liver, correct? Yeah. Is that what you said? Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you're going to show an image like this in a paper, if you're, if you're going to publish a paper with an actual photograph, okay, that's not super common. It's because I can see something. The reader can see something. What, and, and so what was your claim again? What did, what did you say about it? Um, it's... It just shows the representative livers for ROC1 wild type and ROC1 non cleavable. Yeah, but the, like, so, so you may, you guys, and this is, a, here's another good thing. We should probably do some actual dissections of live tissue at some point. Again, I'd have to get permission to do that, but that's not what a liver looks like. Um, are those tumors? Those are tumors, correct, right. So really, they're showing the difference in the in the tumor formation, the car the uh, carcinogenic um, aspect of this. Those are gross, right? And so that's kind of also what they're they're actually they're they actually counted numbers in C, number of tumors. It's a really sloppy graph too because they did it in two different. E life, man, they've gone downhill. Um, but then they have tumor volume, and you have extremely high tumor volume in the wild types. Wild types? Do I have that right? Yeah, in the wild types, but not in the NCs. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so. Yeah, so um, 6C just shows how ROC1 non cleavable mice develop less tumor. And figure seven, it shows how there are similar liver to body mass ratios. And if you look at 7E, you can see that there's liver sections and then the graph shows the percent fibrotic area which basically shows how there's no significant no significant difference between the genotypes okay so in figure eight you can see how especially 8D, you can see how the neutrophils and the tissue damage, how they like influence the HCC tumors. I just want to make a note, go back to uh, figure eight. I do think it's kind of cool. This, this in D, that is, that's not, those aren't real images from some experiment. They're actually a model. They're, they're a drawing. They included a drawing of the model of what's going on. I think predicting that this might end up in cancer medical textbooks at some point. Which is showing a little bit of forethought or hubris, one or the other. But, right, I mean, uh, adults, have you seen this very often in a regular paper? I, I don't, I haven't. I like it, though. I like what they did. It's, it's very simple. It's easy to read. Okay, go ahead, Angela. I'm sorry. Okay, so conclusions and implications. 
So rock one non-cleavable mice with more liver more liver damage demonstrated a greater sterile inflammation. And this study is the first to show the role of rock one cleavage in limiting the harmful effects of apoptosis on tissue health. And the long-term benefits of acute sterile inflammation acts as an effective way to suppress liver cancer. And that's it. Interesting. So, so what, they're gonna try to knock down rock one in humans with some CRISPR or something like that? Like actually, here's a question for you, Angelique, that you should be able to answer. The, um, how'd you, where did you find this? Did you, was this in an article in one of those sites like Science Daily or something and, and you just went and got the paper? Yeah, I just went on the website. You just went on eLife straight up? Yeah. Oh, well, oh, geez. Wow. Okay. Um, I had a, I had a professor who, who used to say stuff like, 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 oh, I don't read other articles. I only read the primary literature. And I was like, Ugh. like, I, I, I don't only read the primary literature because I don't understand it. And I'm usually not interested in it, but I wonder, so if you did, if it was published in some article, uh, a secondary or tertiary article, it would, it would have probably speculated a little more about that. So do you think that this should have been published in eLife? Um, yeah, I guess. Yeah, I don't know. I would say the e-life of when I published in it back when it was one of the, <laughs> I'm saying was, because I it's apparently, I don't know, apparently they're, uh, quality control has gone down so slightly but it used to be one of the sexy ones that's, you know, like nature, science, cell, e-life. They were all kind of a group. And, and I don't know, every time we do one, I find these silly errors. But this is kind of cool. I know I know that they were trying to, I'm looking at figure eight. They, uh, I know they were trying to push more overall understanding in each paper like you're supposed to provide some model like this so it's good to see that they actually did that uh one thing that i had a question about was sterile inflammation that was new to me did you did you look that up at all um yeah i think it's like your response to like your body's response to something without a, a pathogen, right? So usually you get an inflammatory response to infections by bacteria or viruses or something. In this case, a sterile inflammation is caused by mechanical trauma, ischemia, stress, or environmental conditions that do not include pathogens. Which is interesting. I really hadn't thought about it that way. Back to the journal thing. I don't remember eLife or life in general or nature. I don't remember those being journals that had so many micro articles. Like, I just remember them being like macro stuff. But then again, that's what I studied. So that's what I looked for. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, w when I was doing it and, and I look at, I have a, I was a member of the um, American Association for the Advancement of Science, AAAS, which, it, which publishes, pub, oh no, which publishes Science Magazine. And they would send me the physical copies, which is why I have a thousand of them here in my bookshelf. Um, and I would look at the stuff that was pertinent to me, but it was nice to see articles about space exploration or you know geology and things like that 
Um, but eLife specifically was a was a bio one. I, I've never seen a, a marine science or environment. Well, maybe or environmental, but a marine science. Have you seen a marine science thing in Eli? Not recently, though. I haven't actually looked. I mean, the reason I published my last paper there um, was because my editor was Eve Martyr, who's a Brandeis, and and she was me a mentor for two of my my mentors, Carlos Eisenman and for Kathy Sawicki. So kind of had a, I had a long conversation with her at the, before it got published to try to convince her that it was, you know, worthwhile. I think she's going to win the Nobel prize in the next few years. So that would be, that'd be big. She, her, her work is on, um, uh, neural circuits and how they work. She's kind of cr crucial for understanding how neural circuits work. Uh, anybody have any questions or um, anybody going back to the play? Campbell, who are you with? Who's that? It's Emma. Hi. Was she with you the whole time? Yeah. It wasn't my fault. Campbell made me get her a prom dress. Uh -huh. had, I, had I known that you were there, I would have said more negative things about you. Um, anybody have any questions about stuff? Angelie's presentation? No? Okay. Next week is Mr. Joyce. Uh, I don't know if he's here. If, if he's here, please uh, send me your paper immediately. And I will try to upload these as soon as possible. And uh, maybe we'll, we'll try to be a little flexible and get out and look at the stars one of these nights coming up. Okay? Uh, enjoy your day off on Monday. Oh, I'm going to have to change the date. That's that's the point. Yeah, the 24th, we're going to have to not have it that on the Monday because now it's off. It's going to have to be Tuesday. So if you have a problem, let me know as usual. And good job, Anjali. And I'm going to go back and listen to uh, The Hills Being Alive. Goodbye, everyone.